Next on the Broadway show, the best in the West, iconic filmmaker Steven Spielberg is here to talk about his seven time Oscar nominated film, West Side Story. Plus, we're chatting with one of the stars of the new Broadway revival of Funny Girl, Ramin Karamloo. And say hello to one of the fresh new faces of Mrs. Doubtfire, the musical. You'll get to know Annalise Scarpacci. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. The Broadway Show is back with another stellar episode. I'm Tamsin Fidel. The Broadway revival of Funny Girl opens on Broadway in April, and its star-studded cast, for sure, led by Beanie Feldstein, five-time Emmy winner Jane Lynch, and Tony and Olivier Award nominee Ramin Karamloo. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. Thanks, Tamsin. Ramin Karamloo will take on the iconic leading man role of Nick Arnstein opposite Beanie Feldstein in the spring's hotly anticipated revival of Funny Girl. We met up in the heart of Times Square to talk all about it. People have literally been waiting for Funny Girl to play Broadway ever since 1964 when it first opened at the Winter Garden Theater up there, yeah. Barbara Streisand and Sidney Chaplin. It has never been back on Broadway. There have been many attempts to bring it back to Broadway and now it's finally coming and you're in it. That's crazy and I feel, I didn't take it for granted but it, was, it didn't really dawn on me how important this show is to New York City. You know, like this is part of your culture. This is part of like a coming of age for many people. It was their, they grew up with it. So there's a real nostalgia but also this is going to be this generation's funny girl. So I think it's going to, uh, it's going to marry both worlds and bring the story back and it's got so much heart. Beanie Feldstein is phenomenal and uh, it, an absolute joy to work with every day as well. I feel like one of the reasons why we haven't seen Funny Girl on Broadway in all these years, almost 60 years, is the Barbara Streisand thing. This show made Barbara Streisand a star. This is a legendary performance and it's always been kind of like, who's going to take this on? And Beanie Feldstein sort of came into our consciousness in the last few years. Everyone's sort of fallen in love with her. What's it like in the rehearsal room? As I say, it works from the top down and she's a great leader and she is a phenomenal Fanny Bryce, but she's gonna be even better. Hello, gorgeous. Nikki Arnstein, Nikki Arnstein. I love it. I, I mean, that, that's like iconic. That's Barbara Streisand and the, you know, we, we all know those, those words. That's you now. Of course, we also talk about Omar Sharif who played the role in the film. Yeah. Egyptian actor. So it kind of has a link to Middle Eastern handsome dudes like you. Well, listen, your words, not mine. And I, <laughs> I you know, those are big shoes to fill as well. Omar Sharif is a ridiculously uh, amazing actor. But again, you just take one day at a time, serve the piece as best as possible. We got an amazing company, Jane Lynch, Jared Grimes, this company is, yeah. like when Jared dances, oh I'm like, God, yeah. he's got this thing about, he makes it look so effortless that it almost makes you think, oh yeah, it looks easy, I'll do that. And you think, wait a minute, how are you doing all this? He's, he makes me want to dance, I'll put you that way. You have a lot of great stuff to do with Beanie in this show. Um, the, it, the relationship between Fanny and Nick Arstein, her, her real husband, the yeah. real guy, there's a real story, fraught with drama and romance, high emotions, it, it's, it's quite a story. Yeah, it's bittersweet, uh, heartbreaking love story. I remember when we did our first cold read, we getting choked up by the end. I was like, I don't know why I didn't anticipate this, what, what was happening with this relationship and the sort of like where they start at the beginning of the show to where they end. It's quite a journey and it's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, you're going to break Beanie's heart every night. We're all going to be watching. Well, you night. know, without it, there's no story. <laughs> so this is a revised book by Harvey Firestein, yeah. Michael Mayer's director. And there's new choreography by Eleanor Scott and Ayadeli Cassell. Yeah. So this is really a new funny girl. It's an opportunity to take a classic and look at it with fresh eyes. Absolutely. And with Ayadeli bringing in that tap world, it's, it's a whole different, they're different cats, man. These are the cream of the crop and seeing what they do, it's, it's, there's gonna be so much in the show that stops the show. Uh -huh. And everyone shines and everyone brings their A game, like their, their star power as their skills. It's, it's crazy, it's crazy to see in the room, to experience it. And then I think, what am I gonna offer? You know? And the score is pretty fantastic. Yeah, it's a whole new world for me, singing that sort of jazzy swing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not in my, uh, wheelhouse which is great because every day I'm finding new things as a singer but there's some new stuff we're we're creating and adding which yeah, again I didn't realize was going to be in the show and is there's a lot more singing 
oh. than since day one, so I'll put it that way. You didn't have the same background that a lot of the musical theater performers on Broadway have. It feels like you kind of came here on a roundabout path. Yeah, like I was born in Iran. We escaped because of the revolution in 78, moved to Italy, and then from Italy, as refugees went to Canada and started life there, you know, hard working parents. So I was brought up like a, what you call a typical Canadian kid back in the day, hockey, everything was sports. I was a bit rough around the edges. I'd fight a little more than I should be fighting. And I got suspended for a year of fighting from my hockey team in high school. And at that point I saw Phantom of the Opera and I, it was the first time I felt a lump in my throat. I didn't know what these emotions were. I thought, I don't know what I'm experiencing here, but I like it. Lo and behold, I started getting into Phantom more. I kept listening to it. I'd skip school to go watch it. Don't skip school, go to school, stay in school. I'd skip school to watch Phantom of the Opera and I'd start meeting the actors and I'd be asking questions. And then at this point I'm into like De Niro, Pacino, Brando, all these like the studio actors started reading books on acting. I think, I think I want to do this. I want to be the Phantom. And then my friend was giving me grief about it, like, you know, giving me a bit of rib. I was like, I bet you'll become the Phantom. Made a bet at 16. And at 26, I phoned him up. I said, guess what? <laughs> tonight, tonight, it all began tonight. I saw you on the world went away. This is a must-see movie musical event of the year. And right now, the reimagining of West Side Story is nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director for Steven Spielberg. I had the chance to chat with the master filmmaker and rising young star of West Side Story, Rachel Ziegler. Rachel, let me start with you. How, how does this feel for you? Oh my gosh, loaded question. <laughs> it's surreal, it's overwhelming. Uh, it's a huge honor. I, I, I can't believe that this this little group project we made two and a half years ago is finally coming out. It's 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 amazing. You know, you're at the center of the frame right now. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk about you and musicals that you've done in the past before and um, how it all ended up here. Yeah, you know, much like Steven, I was raised with a love of music and a love for classic musical theater. Um, I was very fortunate enough to live in a close proximity to Manhattan and therefore I got to see Broadway shows all the time. And it really started with the Disney theatrical company to see all of their musicals. I saw Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, Lion King, Mary Poppins. I saw all of those before I was introduced to the classics live on stage like Phantom of the Opera and Les Mis. Um, and West Side Story was just a huge part of my upbringing and I, you know, now it's come full circle in a way. Um, but on stage, you know, I, I didn't do professional theater. I, you know, unlike a lot of our cast, this was my first professional gig. And so um, I, I really credit my my learning curve to my experience on stage. And, you know, I started on Fiddler on the Roof and then I, you know, all the way to doing Maria on stage when I was 16. And now that legacy is immortalized forever in a Steven Spielberg film. I feel like you got a good teacher there sitting yeah, next to Yeah, he, he's pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I was, you know, because I was, listen, I was also on a learning curve uh, mm -hmm. because this may, may have been Rachel's first professional job, the first time she was in front of a camera, mm -hmm. but this is my first musical. So mm -hmm. I had a very steep learning curve. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I've been a fan of musicals my entire life, but you can't be a fan and a, and a, and a director of musicals just because you're a fan. Um, uh, I've know I've seen every Arf Arthur Freed production mm -hmm. of every single MGM musical ever made, and still it doesn't prepare you to be a director of musicals. Um, I surrounded myself with some of the best people from Broadway. Instead of bringing Broadway to Hollywood and making him do it my way, I basically had them adopt me and I came and fire, found Tony Kushner, Tony winning Tony Kushner and mm -hmm. Paul Taswell who did the costumes for um, Hamilton and, and Justin Peck, the associate director of the New York City Ballet Company and 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 certainly Janine Tesori, you know, with all of her Broadway work. And I picked the best and the brightest to help me acclimate to this mm -hmm. sort of new genre that I'm so happy I've had a chance to sample. Mm -hmm. and retire on <laughs> I'm not making oh, any more musicals. The... I'm not making any more, no musicals, more musicals after this. this <laughs> We're this, done. <laughs> this satisfied me. <laughs> never say never, never say never. No, no, never say never. But, but in terms of, I don't know, maybe I'll do a stage play someday, but that that's another frontier I've never imagined oh, doing. Boy. Um, but 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 the, the, the making of this, the, the reimagining of West Side Story uh, is one of the greatest dreams I've ever had come true in my entire career. What were the challenges, though, of remaking a, a cultural icon like the original West Side Story? How, where do you begin? 
Well, I, you, you begin with the integrity of the source material by four geniuses who put this thing on the boards in 1957. Every decision I made was based on the original Broadway play, not uh, the, the 1961 movie directed by my friend, Robert Wise. Uh, this was something that I really wanted to honor the original bones of the original story and, and its own um, obligation to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, which they, which they were very uh, uh, certainly upfront about. Jerome Robbins sure. was, um, and um, and I just wanted this story to be for this generation. Uh, sadly, and uh, not oddly, more sadly than oddly, uh, the generation this film's intended to be to be th that we designed for never saw West Side Story uh, on television or in a movie theater, mm -hmm. and they probably haven't heard the songs, and they haven't um, they don't know the story. This will be this will be something new for all of them, which is the reason I made this movie now. Oh yeah, honey. Broadway's Ariana DeBose is also nominated for her performance in West Side Story for Best Supporting Actress. Before she was Hollywood's next big thing, we watched her rise to stardom in big time Broadway productions like Hamilton, Summer, the Donna Summer Musical, and A Bronx Tale. We talked to her about her work on West Side Story. I am one of the luckiest people in the world. I got to make West Side Story with Steven Spielberg. As an Afro-Latina, I'm the darkest woman on camera to play this role, um, which is a huge deal in and of itself because historically, Latinas are portrayed on the small screen and the big screen as all being light-skinned with beautiful, like potentially brown or raven hair. But Latinos look like me. I've already heard from so many young Latinx people who are just like, Thank you. We finally see ourselves. And when you can see it, then you, you start to believe that you too can do it. Still plenty more to talk about on this edition of The Broadway Show. Up next, we're catching up with an icon. Melba Moore joins us to talk about her legendary career. It's one of Broadway's most hilarious new shows, and it's strictly for the poppets. It's Mrs. Doubtfire, of course. It stars Tony nominee Rob McClure in the title role, and it also features some amazing young performers, including Annalise Scarpacci. She is this week's Fresh Face. I'm Annalise Scarpacci. I play Lydia Hillard in Mrs. Doubtfire on Broadway. My parents are very musical. They love music. Their wedding song was actually All I Ask of You from Phantom of the Opera. So I guess you could say that musicals were already in my blood. Doing theater in New York and on Broadway was always my dream. I actually found something uh, that I wrote in the second grade and it says, what do you want to do when you grow up? And my answer was, I want to be a lead in a Broadway show. My very first Broadway audition was for Billy Elliot, which um, is my favorite musical ever. I was very stressed out and I had a panic attack in front of the entire creative team and I ran out of the room. At the time, we didn't realize that I had been experiencing early symptoms of Crohn's disease. I think it's important for people to know that people with invisible illnesses like mine are able to do things that normal people can do. A couple of nights ago, I had my treatment in the morning and then I went to rehearsal and then I did the show at night. And I can't even describe to you how I was feeling. I was just, I felt like I wanted to crawl into my bed and cry. And I did the whole show and I went through and I stuck with it. And I was very proud of myself that I did because I wasn't gonna let this little beast inside of me ruin anything. <laughs> my 16th birthday, I wanted it to be so much fun. And my birthday is around Halloween. I am a true, true Scorpio. So in true Scorpio fashion, I had a wicked themed Sweet 16. I consider myself more of a, of a Glinda, but with like, my moon is an Elphaba. <laughs> when I found out that I got Lydia Hillard, my manager called me. I see my mom in the corner. My mom had no idea what was happening. And when my agent said, you got Doubtfire, I thought he was lying. And I just broke down in tears because he was dead serious. <laughs> And I just crashed down onto the floor. There's a video on it, of it um, on my Instagram. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I literally 
was in hysterics and it was just like this whole release of energy that all of my hard work paid off. What is it? Oh, no. What is it? I have a feeling you already know. Oh, what is it? I don't. I get to play this character who is so sure of herself and so sure that she needs to make sure that her siblings are okay and that her family is surviving. And she just wants her dad to tell the truth. But besides all the funny, it has all of this heart and it's all of this soul and it has an incredible, incredible message. And my character, Lydia, her whole story revolves around the relationship between herself and her father. So it's really great that I get to have this moment and I bring in my relationship with my own dad into the show too. And for me, my family is my whole world. And to be a part of a show that is about family and that is about love and that is about acceptance, it's just a great gift and I'm so honored to be a part of it. Broadway is back, and so is the Broadway show. Thanks for sticking around. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Melba Moore is a legend, a Tony Award winner, and longtime veteran of both stage and screen. Let's go ahead and send it out to Paul Wontorek. Melba Moore joined the ranks of Broadway's elite when she earned a Tony Award in 1970 for her unforgettable performance in the musical Pearly. I got a chance to catch up with the music and theater icon at Cafe Fiorello, just steps away from Lincoln Center. I actually love sitting with you because one thing that happened to me during COVID was I, I found myself reconnecting with a lot of the musicals and the stars that made me fall in love with Broadway. I got a record player and listening to vinyl and vinyl of you and, uh, and some of these amazing shows that came before. How does that all feel to you? YouTube clip. People watch your YouTube clip of you in Pearly, right? I mean, that's like people, people love that song. And Well, first of all, one of the uh, great things about Pearly is I had probably a revelation to have my then manager husband ask Philip Rose who directed and produced it to put it on film so people could continue to see it. Otherwise, a lot of people would not right. know about it at all. Right, yeah. It was many years ago that you were in the in Pearl. I don't need to. I don't need to count. We don't need to count how many. And it was at the time one of the first sort of all-black musicals. So I'm wondering, someone like you, who I consider a trailblazer of that time, how do you look at this new conversation about the need for diversity? It's a progressive movement of humanity evolving to be in love with each other, to understand that we're a family, and to celebrate the differences. Yeah and to uh, have them be new frontiers for us. We don't know, right. but we're open to learn. That's amazing to, to keep happening, to keep happening. What do you remember about that night that you won the Tony Award? Not a lot, but I play the tape. <laughs> because uh, the experience was so overwhelming for me. I've never studied acting. Our first play was Hair. Yeah, Hair is one of those, people must always ask you about Hair. I mean, that's sort of like, and they always want to know what, they want to know if you were naked. In the beginning, I didn't want to do it, but then I got curious, so I did it. How'd that feel? Very strange. I'm used to my prophecy when I'm naked. <laughs> Since I haven't spent a lot of time le lately doing theater, I spent a lot of time in R&B recording field. These are, I meet a lot of black people who never saw Hair and don't know about it because it, it was a hippie movement. The thing that people know about hair now, most people, regardless of background, is that I replaced Diane Keaton. That, that's the thing they are. And of course, you know, Diane Keaton's really not replaceable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're a kid getting into it, you just kind of want to do anything. But now I feel like you probably have more focus. What kind of projects like get you excited? For me to come back to Broadway should be in music. Yeah. That's very broad, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's so many good ones. Yeah. And I've, I've been away from it to know the names of everything so much. Right. Right? I've really been focused on recordings. And that's my, been my tool for keeping my instrument good and, and to uh, stay in front of people. And so now I'm getting 
offers for people to either create things for me or to bring me back. And fortunately, I've got a lot of people that's in theater. They know all the plays that might be good for me. So right. Actually, I have people um, looking for, for projects for me to do that I know are going to be great. And more than likely, I won't have to audition now. This is The Broadway Show, and we're back in just a few. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.